thanks all of you for coming. I, at the moment, don't know. Well, yes, I do know, which is the topic to be most celebratory about the change of the weather or Ivan Bolin being here, but the latter is clearly um, the better thing. Um, I, I'm not going to go into the baseball or the presidential debates which are on right now. I thank you all for eschewing the presidential debates <laughs> in favor of something more enduring. Um, <laughs> I, I, I want to thank the various entities. This particular fall series of the Holloway Poetry Readings um, is, has been made possible thanks to uh, an array of generous donors. Um, the Holloway Fund is very generous and, and great, but because we're bringing uh, uh, an unusually large number of poets to campus, and because some of them are coming from Scotland, Ireland, and England, um, airfare and lodging, because we want them to be able to stay more than one night after traveling so far, um, has, is more expensive than usual. So I'm going to read the thank yous here. And they're sincere thank yous. Um, this event is supported by Poets and Writers, Inc. through a grant it has received from the James Irvine Foundation. Other important donors are Professor Ian Duncan in the Florence Green Bixby Chair in English, Professor Robert Hass and the Distinguished Chair in Poetry and Poetics, and Professor Charles Altieri and the Rachel Anderson Stageberg Endowed Chair. Also contributing from those three chairs and professors are all, as you know, m most of you will know, part of the English department faculty. Other campus organizations that have contributed to making this fall series possible are the Townsend Center for the Humanities at UC Berkeley, the Center for British Studies at UC Berkeley, Anthony Cascardi and the Office of the Dean of Arts and Humanities at UC Berkeley, and the UC Berkeley's the Berkeley English Department's Fund for Lectures and Events. Tonight's reading, of course, features Ivan Boland, reading with a first-year grad student and poet here in the department, Mary Wilson. Mary is a poet, and in anticipation of adjoining poetry to scholarship, she has begun her PhD, PhD studies here. She will be introduced by another emerging poet scholar, Daniel Benjamin, who will be reading from his own work in a reading a few weeks from now. Ivan Boland is an internationally esteemed Irish poet who comes to us from Dublin via Stanford, where she is the Bella Mayberry and Eloise Mayberry Knapp Professor in Humanities and the Melvin and Bill Lane Professor for the, direc for the Director of the Creative Writing Program. Ivan will be introduced by Catherine Flynn, a scholar and historian of international Irish literature who joined the English department this fall. And then before I leave the podium and give way to all of these illustrious personages, um, I want to remind you that on October 11, so that's eight days from now, Catherine Walsh, who's the visiting Holloway lecturer for the semester, will be giving her reading here in this room again at 6.30. On October 30th, the Scottish poet W.N. Herbert will be reading with Adrian Aku. And then in November 13 and 15, there will be readings by three British poets, Tony Lopez with Daniel Benjamin, and then Keston Sutherland and John Wilkinson. And finally, on Friday, November 16, from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. in this room will be a colloquium on boundless poetics. All of these are open to grad students, undergrads, um, and to the general public. And now to uh, Daniel Benjamin. Thanks again. I'm very excited to be hearing Mary Wilson read today. Um, as Lynn mentioned, Mary is a first year PhD student in the English department. And before coming here, she completed an MFA in poetry at Brown. One of Mary's poems begins, eventually it will come together like a rock field. 
I find this very striking. What grows in a rock field? What kind of coming together can emerge from desolation on the one hand and openness on the other? Later in the same poem we read, it is, quote, kept hidden out of sight, which might have been a point in time it was so far from anything we knew to be the present. We struggle to see a future. Its, its presence is beyond our vision. Mary's poems reach out to this future from the rock field that denies language its ability to create anew. This is also, of course, deeply political. Quote, permanence began to sound like politics, especially in this damage, end quote. If language's creative capacity is limited, then how can we imagine politics creating a future that heals this damage? Mary's precise poems do not take us to this future, but they open spaces around the damage, providing a whole range of ways that a rock field can be fertile. Please welcome Mary Wilson. Thanks, Daniel. And thank you to Lynn and Christopher for asking me to read tonight, um, and to Evan Boland as well. It's a great honor. And to everyone who came out and is missing the debates for this, um, if I say anything you disagree with, just sh shout it out. <laughs> can make it a debate. <laughs> we don't need a moderator. Um, so the first poem I'm going to read from is a longer poem called Not Only. Um, I think of this as a long narrative poem. I think I'm the only one who who thinks that about it <laughs> so far. Um, but I'm going to read a shorter excerpt, and then I'm going to read a few from a longer series called When We Were Men. Not only. At some point, after knowing her a month or two, I said I'd known her just a month or two. She told me to do something. It sounded good. And so I told myself that second, as I looked at her across the rigging, I'd do everything she told me from then on. My decision was made in just those words, not only what she told me, but everything. Everything was a way to love her, love outside the standard terms of loving, whereas only, only was just some strange form of idol worship. What I did. She told me to, you must remember, to piece together animals from lumps of clay, to send them about our business, since she said what we created must imagine us. And they did, with horns, skin, and claws bursting from our corners, and above our necks our skulls were huge and round as if a sun had fallen there. What I did. On rare days, a pirouette backwards, which is near impossible, borders on an outline of a song cast as an outline of a shape that shadows black and insubstantial mornings when she turned to me and smiled, flashing her teeth. What I did. I realized dirt could be an apt container for our bodies. I learned how to levitate inside it. In the morning, a green fog collects around my throat. In water, off the red pier, bodies nod like buoys, weighted and strung. What I saw. Blue talking together in order to float, doubled, roping down easy in order to ring, adjacent, and the pier spun up from the dark bay, glinting. What I did. Not kill them for, not myself, to know what I was lifting. She said happiness undid them. What I did not do, I circled like an eel. What I did. To stall for time, since, after all, in time, everything can be said to exist. Actions are different, have been known to tremble. This she confirmed by demonstration, holding the flat of her thumb to my wrist. What I saw. 
train tracks, duck blinds, rivulets, wire, where the human emerges as repetition, one foot hanging off the boat as if testing. So these next poems are from the series When We Were Men. Um, I have a hard time titling poems, and I started writing all these poems with men's names in them, mostly very Anglo-Saxon men's names. Um, and at some point I realized that it's just so much easier to title a poem like John or Dave, um, and just kept running with it. Um, so this is from When We Were Men. John. When John grew out his mustache, we said everything he did was with his mustache, such as John is swimming with his mustache, John is clipping tulips with his mustache, John is doing sweet rhymed karaoke with his mustache, but one could ask, really, where is John now if not with his mustache? Where, if not at all times, with his mustache, and one wouldn't know the answer. But then that bereavement of the answer didn't matter. John was over and above the guy behind the mustache, and he wore a yellow tank top with his mustache, and he walked along the guardrail with a stick that sounded when he hit the rail at intervals, and when he did this, something tried to hum in all of us. Dave. Dave is on a roll. His chair is sprouting feet. His feet are sprouting wheels. And in each of these wheels, a tiny golden egg breaks open, looks around itself, and then declares itself a mother. Tom. Sublingual Tom persuaded pain-free Tom to try an oral indwelling or a best route to the bedpan kind of Tom, our Tom whose limbs raked sore and stiff, and Perry persuaded slow-release Tom of a three-day escalation or a three-day dehydration where we find Tom nigh at sunrise on an earth stripped painfully of Tom as out the window blinds a halo Tom, the light regards in streaming through a tube injected day, so mild and impermanent Tom observes a day with properties of metal, although later, when the hand grasped bed rail Tom declined the intravenous sun inflected orally and white round tablet Tom, some pains indwelling visceral, unknown Tom couldn't breathe, not well, but wet and guttural Tom, the Tom of buckets clanking in his depths, the time released Tom thrown against his stones, Tom was en route by that time on the third day, Tom. Damien. He had a yellow glow around him, said the head which summarized beneath an awning. The wind blew back from it, the head, its spectacle of mourning. And most of these poems, um, by the way, don't refer to real individuals, but there are a few references. Um, this is one of them. This is Phaedrus. Phaedrus. Talk suited you because you were refined as if a lover or a younger man had written favors in your cloth, and on a colder night you threw it all around you, met him up against the wall which separates his breathing from your other side of things. Kyle. Kyle reaches out a hand to gather letters. Kyle's hand is ringed in wool. If a body were to fall in love with Kyle, it would happen on a warm night, when the wool around his hands pulls back to show a flower growing in the darkness of his forearm. Kyle otherwise unravels. Kyle is in love and falls into the world for its newness. 
He loves a clean white paper, a different colored pen, a new letter. The body, on the other hand, loves Kyle, only Kyle, and so the body falls into him. Charles. In the gold rush, Charles eats the carcass of a shoe. He pays particular attention to the bones, the nail bones, which are slender and have valuable leather. The slender taste of something known to Charles. The storm outside of Charles, white and whistling, the hunger of the longing that induces it. Jason. The outside is warmer than the inside. Jason understands this. When he notices a window, Jason isn't sure which way to look. He puts an overshirt around his undershirt inside, then goes outside and pulls the undershirt out from his collar. If he were another, Jason would grab Jason by the collar. If he were another, Jason would pull Jason closer. Alexander. Next was Alexander, the errand runner, who we all knew for a satchel that was always green and never full. Gradually, the green dulled into camouflage, and in response, the skin of Alexander grew more lively, signaling a plethora of multiplied foodstuffs. Alexander sustained us. We knew him for a radiance that sheltered mosses, seedlings burrowed in the rings beneath his chin. All manner of forests waited for him. Alexander, with his satchel, hurried towards them. Edmund. There are plenty of reasons to recall how the pines pulled winter from a closet full of furs, especially now when everything is dark and you've lost your clothes and your coat is forever turning into tree bark, quivering and cursed. Harold. Harold had a certain body to him, lying on the grass in sunlight. Or to re-examine this, it might have been the nightlight that illuminated Harold under blankets as a man-shaped lump beneath them. And it might have been the blankets that gave Harold's body to him. Christopher. Christopher left us in winter. Signs of life breathed into his lungs as if a bird had flown in there and struggled for a time and then succumbed. Will. Most believed in the age of books, when there were footholds, most believed in spring, Will did, uncovered dirt, and belonged to no one. This was in the summer, when Will on his deathbed. This was when Will swore by a long visage. To read aloud to us was something Will did often, Will, with his voice full of metal, in spring, and the war outside was green and endless. Ben. Ben was talking to the woman who becomes her own materials. In the country that becomes itself, the country whitewashed and smelling of newsprint, Ben was saying to the woman who was colored like the air surrounding Ben what joy there was in confession. That's it. Thank you.
Hi. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce Ivan Boland this evening. Um, I was fortunate enough to be part of a teaching team with Ivan at Stanford, and uh, I saw firsthand there her expertise in, um, in two roles, as a teacher of poetry and as a teacher of poetry writing. Um, Ivan, as Lynn mentioned, is director of the creative writing program there the esteemed, with the esteemed Stegner Fellowship, as well as a mentor of teachers of poetry writing. Um, it's as a teacher of poetry that I know Ivan best. Um, her course, the course that she lectured on and that I um, helped to teach, um, looked at the reshaping of poetic form in response to catastrophic events, from the sonnets of World War I trenches to haiku composed in Japanese concentration camps, uh, Japanese internment camps, sorry, during the Second World War, to poetry written in response to the troubles in the north of Ireland. Um, I was struck over and over again by Ivan's ability to inspire first-year students at Stanford with the sense of the seriousness of the agenda of poetry, its capacity to dismantle itself in order to articulate pain, and to rehumanize the world through acts of imagination. Um, it was not just through her interpretations that Ivan managed to do that, but through her power as a reader of poetry. Um, I got to know her power as a reader of her own poetry at the James Joyce conference last year, where she read with um, Paul Muldoon and Sinead Marcy. Um, on that event, Ivan really displayed her range as a poet. Um, her poems ranged from the intimate, or combined the intimate and the historical, and explored together traditions of literature with traditions of domestic life. Um, she read that the science of cartography is limited, a poem from her 1994 book, In a Time of Violence, that looks at the failures of representation uh, regarding the trauma of the Irish potato famine of the 19th century. And she also read an elegy from my mother in which she scarcely appears from her 2007 book, Domestic Violence. And the poem is an indirect portrait of her mother through kitchen utensils which becomes a meditation on mortality of all creatures and all created things. Ivan has written 23 books of poetry, the earliest as a student at Trinity College Dublin in 1962, and the most recent, Domestic Violence, in 2007. She's also had a recent anthology of her work entitled New Collected Poems, published in the US by Norton in 2008, and a recent book of prose, A Journey with Two Maps, from 2011. Throughout her work, the, do the domestic figures as a topos through which she connects issues of personal identity, experience, and loss with questions of history. The domestic is a space of exiled female experience, a space that must be included in a nation's identity, but also a space in which self-deception and hatred can be nurtured, in the case of Ireland during the Troubles. Avant's feminist concerns have motivated her, not just in her writing, but as a publisher and an editor. In 1980, she was co-founder of Arlen House, an Irish feminist press. She edited the collection After Every War, 20th Century Women Poets with, for Princeton University Press in 2006. She also edited the selected poems of Charlotte Mew. And uh, she's written, and her feminism has also um, informed her uh, non-poetic writings, her um, prose writings on poetry, including her now 1995 essay, Object Lessons, The Life of the Woman and the Poet in Our Time, which attacks the male-defined Irish lyric tradition. Questions of Irishness and her relationship to Ireland as a poet uh, continue to be productive for Van. After her reading at the James Joyce Conference, she spoke about the power that Irish poetry has gained from the damage done to the Irish through the English language as a vehicle for exploitative institutions. She also spoke about the old memory in Ireland of the connection between the poet and the audience, a vestige of the oral culture that persisted in Ireland for such a long time. Perhaps these two features account for the power of her direct, impassioned voice, which um, I will let you hear now. Okay.
thanks to Kate for the kind introduction. And uh, it was a real pleasure to hear Mary. Uh, I'm glad to read with you. I enjoyed that. Uh, you know, I'm just not going to read for so long, but I'm going to read some or talk a little bit about some new work. Um, if you will sort of bear with me. It's a little more difficult to read new work. But, you know, this work comes out of, it, it comes out of, in some ways, a poem that I wrote uh, some years ago. And it's, the poem, as I think often happens, left questions in my mind. I've o often said that there is in Ireland particularly visibly, I think it's really true of most places, a big difference between the past and history. And you know, history in Ireland is in so many ways uh, quite a glamorous narrative of the triumph of the individual. But the past is a much more ambiguous place. It's a place, you know, of, of questions where voices are lost and identities are hidden. And I wrote this poem called Quarantine. Uh, really with that in my mind, it, it comes out of a, a, a few sentences uh, in a book in about 1900. And it was a man remembering the famine in Ireland right back to when he was very young in a village, West Cork, called Carrickstar. These two young people in the middle of the famine in 1847. They left their the workhouse, which which was a terrible place, and they walked back to the cabin they'd lived in together, and it was a really bitter night. And this is his very brief description in the book. You know, in the morning they're both found dead, but but her feet are held against his chest. He tried to warm them as she died, and we know nothing else about those people. And it was really that that made me write the poem, but it was also uh, my question at the end of the poem about the genres of poetry that overlook these things. It's called quarantine. In the worst hour of the worst season of the worst year of a whole people, a man set out from the workhouse with his wife. He was walking, they were both walking north. She was sick with famine fever and could not keep up. He lifted her and put her on his back. He walked like that west and west and north until at nightfall, under freezing stars, they arrived. In the morning, they were both found dead, of cold, of hunger, of the toxins of a whole history. But her feet were held against his breastbone. The last heat of his flesh was his last gift to her. Let no love poem ever come to this threshold. There is no place here for the inexact praise of the easy graces and sensuality of the body. There is only time for this merciless inventory. Their death together in the winter of 1847. Also, what they suffered, how they lived, and what there is between a man and woman and in which darkness it can best be proved. Out of that poem came some senses of questions and some new work. The new work belongs to a sequence which is called Without a Country. And it's not as definite as it sounds. It was some question in my mind, who, who is it that is without a country? Do we think that anybody's without a country? When we speak about a country, do we feel we own it? The first poem comes out of those questions. There are no answers in the sequence, and they're not intended to be. The first poem of Without a Country is called Sea Change. And it is a little bit about my background. My father was part of a long history of, of people in Ireland who really had learned to operate the colonial system. In the military, out of the military, in the civil service, they could read or write, they could use that system. But my mother came from an underclass in Ireland, class very little written about and very little spoken about, and they were seafaring. They lived in this cluster in the Boyne Valley, you know, where they got onto ferries, they sailed sailing ships, they got what work they could. Obviously, the people who were the pilots and, and the captains, they could read and write, but many of those people I know from my family background could not. 
they were not stakeholders. They didn't have a country, or, or did they? This poem is called Sea Change, about my grandfather who drowned in the Bay of Biscay uh, long before I was born. What did he leave me, my grandfather who lost his life in a spring tempest at the Chaussée de Pierre Noir at the edge of Biscay? With his roof of half-seen stars, his salty walls rising high and higher to the last inch of the horizon, he built nothing that I could live in. His door of cresting water, his low skies skidding on the waves, his seamen's windows giving on iridescent plankton never amounted to home. And no one lay at night seeing these unfold in their minds with that instinct of amendment history allows instead of memory. I was born in a place, or so it seemed, where every inch of ground was a new fever or a field soaked to its grassy roots with remembered hatreds. And even if I turned to ledger domain to bring land and ocean together, saying water meadow to myself, for instance, the distances remained. A spring night in Dublin, neap tide on the Irish Sea. To the north of here, in the Garden of Remembrance, the dead lie defined by their relation to land. When he looked over the ship's rail at midnight into his ocean garden, all he saw was oxygen unfrocking phosphorus, lacing the sea with greens. So the question uh, was for me, as I said, who doesn't, who doesn't have a country? Who, who and where are those people who, who lose a country, which was a nation, don't believe they have it at all? Because in some part of my mind, though, those people are, are a very important part of things. So if you bear with me, this is a very brief piece of prose, which comes from the book Object Lessons, which was where the question first came up to me, as my grandmother, who died at 30 in a fever ward, came from that seafaring class, all her people were seafaring, how did, how did she fit? This is a, just a brief page of that. My grandmother lived outside history and she died there. A 30-year-old woman with five daughters facing death in a hospital far from home. I doubt that anything around her mattered at that point. But in her lifetime, Ireland had gone from oppression to upheaval. A language had been reclaimed. Laws had changed, conspiracies and explosions were everyday occurrences. She existed at the edge of it. Did she find her nation? And does it matter? In one sense, I think it does. Throughout the decade and a half in which she bore her children and moved nearer to her death, her country restated itself in forceful, painful ways. Just take 1887. During the spring of that year, 25 Fenians were sentenced to long terms of penal servitude. Among them was Tom Clark, who would endure English prison and emerge to die before a British firing squad. In the same year, the Congress of the Gaelic Athletic Association met in Thurles, and it was a stormy meeting. When a priest in Nina tried to propose a different candidate for chairman of the meeting than the local Fenian, there was a split between the clerical and Fenian members, and just imagine the scene. The tables bare and pushed aside, the flushed faces, the scattered papers, and the moon hanging outside a town over a field. The man who raises a fist in the doorway and shouts about another man's betrayal. Small events, local frictions, you might say. Yet I wonder whether she turned in some corridor, looked up from some moment, and heard the whispers and their gossip, which by their force suggested a wider truth. Did she hear in some muttered conversation around her the future of Ireland or an armed struggle or the music of anger or the willingness to die? I doubt it. If she looked up at all, I believe she was just listening for her life. And what was I listening for? Three quarters of a century on, I lift my head and I look up. What troubles me increasingly was not whether she had included the nation in her short life, but whether the nation had included her. So to go back to these people who don't have or, or almost don't have these things, I wanted to take one group of people above all 
who are certainly part of your own country. And it's called The Lost Art of Letter Writing. These were the people who wrote home from America. When they came to America, always writing letters, always trying to have those letters propose some hope that they would get home and some way of hoping that the home was still there. The Lost Art of Letter Writing. The ratio of daylight to handwriting was the same as lace making to eyesight. The paper was so thin it skinned air. The hand was fire and the page tinder. Everything burned away, except the one place they singled out between fingers, held over the long evenings of their leave takings, always asking after what they kept losing always performing, even when a shadow fell across the page and they knew the answer was not forthcoming, the same action. First the leaning down, the pen becoming a staff to walk the fields with as they vanished underfoot into memory. Then the letting up and the lighter stroke which brought back crane's bill and thistle, a bicycle wheel rusting, an iron circle hurting the grass again. And the hedges veiled in hawthorn again just in time for the May novenas, recited in sweet air on a road leading to another road, and then another one widening to a motorway with four lanes, ending in a new town on the edge of a city. And they will never see it. And if we say an art is lost when it no longer knows how to teach a sorrow to speak, come see the way we lost it, stacking letters in the attic, going downstairs so as not to listen to the fields stirring at night as they became memory, and in the morning as they became ink, and what we did so as not to hear them whispering, the only question they knew by heart, the only one they learned from all those epistles of air and unreachable distance how to ask, is it still there? Is it still there? The, the final poem in this sequence, and I'm going to read just a few others, is called A Woman Without a Country. Because finally, in my mind, I thought I did know who didn't have a country. It wasn't me, and it really wasn't my grandfather. And it really was not these people who wrote home, because they had once had a country. Even if it was vanishing as they wrote, they had had it. So who didn't have it? In my view, the agendas of nation making are absolutely suspect. And in the 1840s, you could see that, when the people in Ireland were really dying uh, in the famine, dying on the roadsides, dying of typhus, of fever, of starvation. And there's one notorious and famous drawing. It comes from the London Illustrated News. It comes from a, a tiny uh, town called Clonakilty, hard hit by the famine in Ireland. And a man went down to sketch her for the London Illustrated News. And the way that worked was he would make a sketch and he would hand it to the engraver. The engraver would then make it a commodified image. The image would go back into the London Illustrated News and the London Illustrated News would once again be able to present the Irish as they did in the famine as subhuman. And so the, the image of the woman in Clonakilty shows her with a child in her arms, who we now know from the artist was dead, uh, and a woman absolutely destroyed by fever and by famine. And then that drawing came back, and it was made into an image. And that woman is the woman who doesn't have a country. This is called A Woman Without a Country. As dawn breaks, he enters a room with the odor of acid. He lays the copper plate on the table and reaches for the shaft of the burin. Dublin wakes to horses and rain, street hawkers call. All the news is famine and famine. The flat graver, the round graver, the angle tint tool wait for him. He bends to his work and begins. He starts with the head cutting into the line of the cheek, finding the slope of the skull. 
incising the shape of a face that becomes a foundry of shadows, rendering with a deeper cut into copper the whole woman as a skeleton, the rags of her skirt, her wrist in a bony line forever, severing her body from its native air until she is ready for the page, for the street vendor, for a new inventory, which now to loss and laissez-faire will add the odor of acid and the little pitiless tragedy of being imagined. He puts his tools away one by one and lays them carefully on the deal table, his work done. I'm going to read that poem, uh, The Science of Cartography, which Kate kindly referred to. So it's somewhat the same idea, the, the, the idea of what's left out of the story. Um, you know, we, we tell these narratives, we make these stories, and this is a, a question about map making. Uh, the science of cartography, uh, as it applies, seems to be a, a, an absolutely exact science. But in fact, in 1847, when the British came to Ireland, they made the people who were in the famine work for food, although those people didn't have any strength to do it. And if you look down in the roads in, in Mayo and in Meath, you will see the famine roads where the people built them and then ran out of strength and, and really died building them. But they don't appear on any map. That the science of cartography is limited and not simply by the fact that this shading of forest cannot show the fragrance of balsam, the gloom of cypresses is what I wish to prove. When you and I were first in love, we drove to the borders of Connacht and entered a wood there. Look down, you said, this was once a famine road. I looked down at ivy and the scutch grass rough cast stone had disappeared into, as you told me in the second winter of their ordeal, in 1847, when the crop had failed twice. Relief committees gave the starving Irish such roads to build. And where they died, there the road ended and ends still. And when I take down the map of this island, it is never so, I can say here is the masterful, the apt rendering of the spherical as flat, nor an ingenious design which persuades a curve into a plane, but to tell myself again that the line which says woodland and cries hunger and gives out among sweet pine and cypress and finds no horizon will not be there. I'm going to finish with a, a slightly um, longer poem. It's a poem which for me was really a formative poem in its time. And it's uh, a, it had a, a great um, purpose for me in questioning the, the ideas of poetry and how we think about poetry. And when my second daughter was very small indeed, she got meningitis, she was far away, and she made a great recovery, but she was a very small child. And I sat in this room where these antibiotics, you know, are, are really dripped into um, the head of these little children who get this really dread disease that would once have been fatal. And I used to think to myself, nobody has ever written a poem to an antibiotic. And that really was the beginning of this. Um, it was this idea of what the poem leaves out. And so, this is called The Journey. It was deliberately an attempt to undermine one of the great elite conventions of poetry, which is the dream convention, where the poet goes down to the underworld with a companion and comes back much wiser, much educated. There are, of course, all the great examples from the Aeneid uh, to Dante for that. But I go down to the underworld with Sappho, and I come back uh, no wiser. The Journey. <laughs> And then the dark fell, and there has never, I said, been a poem to an antibiotic. Never a word to compare with the odes on the flower of the raw slow for fever, or the devious Africa seeking turn, or the protein treasures of the seabed. Depend on it, somewhere a poet is wasting his sweet uncluttered meters on the obvious emblem instead of the real thing. Instead of sulfur, we shall have hyssop dipped in the wild blood of the unblemished lamb, so every day the language gets less for the task, and we are less with the language. I finished speaking, and the anger faded and dark fell. 
and the book beside me lay open at the page Aphrodite comforts Sappho in her love's duress. The poplar shifted their music in the garden, a child startled in a dream. My room was a mess. The usual hardcovers, half-finished cups, clothes piled up on an old chair, and I was listening out. But in my head was a loosening and sweetening heaviness. Not sleep, but nearly sleep. Not dreaming really, but as ready to believe and still, unfevered, calm and unsurprised. When she came and stood beside me, and I would have gone with her anywhere, I would have known her anywhere. And she came wordlessly, and without a word, I went with her. Down, 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 without so much as ever touching down. But always, always with a sense of mulch beneath us. The way of stairs winding down to a river. And as we went on, the light went on failing. And I looked sideways to be certain it was she, misshapen, musical Sappho, the scoliest nightingale. And down we went, again down until we came to a sudden rest beside a river in what seemed to be an oppressive suburb of the dawn. My eyes got slowly used to the bad light. At first I saw shadows, only shadows. Then I could make out women and children and in the way they were, the grace of love. Cholera, typhus, croup, diphtheria, she said, in those days they racketed in every back street and alley of old Europe. Behold the children of the plague. Then to my horror, I could see to each nipple some had clipped a limpid shape, suckling darknesses, while others had their arms weighed down, making terrible pietas. She took my sleeve and said to me, be careful. Do not define these women by their work. These, uh, not as washerwomen, trust in dust and sweating, muscling water into linen by the river's edge, nor as court ladies, brailed in silk on wool and woven with an ivory unicorn and hung, nor as lawn dresses, tossing cotton, brisking daylight with lavender and gossip. But these are women who went out like you, when dusk became a dark, sweet with leaves, recovering the day, stooping, picking up teddy bears and rag dolls and tricycles and buckets. Love's archaeology, and they too, like you, stood boot deep in flowers once in summer or saw winter come in with a single magpie in a call of whores, a solo harlequin. I stood fixed. I could not reach or speak to them. Between us was the melancholy river, the dream water, the narcotic crossing, and they had passed over it, its cold persuasions. I whispered, let me be, let me at least be their witness. But she said, what you have seen is beyond speech, beyond song only, not beyond love. Remember it, you will remember it. And I heard her say, but she was fading fast, as we emerged under the stars of heaven, there are not many of us. You are dear and stand beside me as my own daughter. I have brought you here, so you will know forever the silences in which are our beginnings, in which we have an origin, like water, and the wind shifted. And the window clasp opened and banged, and I woke up to find the poetry book stacked, healed piggledy, my skirt spread out where I had laid it, and nothing was changed. Nothing was more clear, but it was wet, and the year was late. The rain was grief in arrears. My children slept the last dog out safely, and I wept. Thank you. Again, thank you all for coming. Uh, no doubt Barack Obama won the debate. Um, <laughs> poetry has won the night, um, as it will win many other nights. Um, there are books by Ivan Boland here for sale, thanks to the uh, Cal Bookstore. Come and take a look at them, buy a copy. Perhaps she'll be willing to sign a copy if you do so. Um, we will see you on October 11, back in this room. That's a Thursday night, again at 6.30 for Catherine Walsh, another Irish poet, um, who will be reading. Thanks again. Good night.